Have you ever wondered how, in our daily lives, we often play detective trying to decipher between fact and fiction? In statistics, that's exactly what hypothesis testing is all about. Let's say a friend claims that married people tend to earn differently than those who are single. But wouldn't we want some evidence in order to believe them? That's where hypothesis testing comes into play, sifting through data to determine the validity of such claims. First things first, understanding the difference between correlation and causation is essential. Just because two things seem related, like marriage and wages in this case, it doesn't mean one causes the other. For instance, if we observed that people who own umbrellas tend to buy more raincoats, it doesn't mean that owning an umbrella causes one to buy raincoats. People are just reacting to rain. The same thing happens with ice cream consumption and shark attacks. It just happens to be the case that, when it is warmer, especially during the summer, more people eat ice cream and swim in the ocean. As far as I know, the most coveted scent amongst sharks is blood and not soft and sweet dairy products. Similarly, in our wage example, we have to be careful not to immediately conclude that marriage causes a change in wages without further investigation. Now, picture yourself at a cafe. Your regular coffee order tastes a bit different today. Your first thought, which we also call the null hypothesis, might be Surely they haven't changed the coffee blend, it's just my taste buds acting up. But the alternative hypothesis lurking in the background is Nope, they've definitely changed the coffee blend. My disappointment is immeasurable and my day is ruined. While unnecessarily pessimistic in this case, we do have the right to be curious about our suspicions. You would not just guess, you would taste again, consult others, or ask the barista. In statistics, gathering evidence and comparing it to what we expect under our initial assumption is the key. Going back to our friend's claim about married individuals, we start assuming, as our null hypothesis, that marriage has no effect on wages. Sure, data might show wage differences between those who are married and those who are not, but the real question is, is this difference meaningful, or did it just happen by mere chance? This is where our test statistic comes in. Think of it as a trustworthiness score of your friend's claim. It measures the credibility of the observed data against our initial assumption. If this score is too far off from what we would expect under our null hypothesis assumption, it's probably time to reconsider. For our wage example, here's a quick look at the numbers with a code I made in Wolfram Mathematica. Our goal is to predict wage considering factors like marital status, education, master's degree, and experience. We can do this with the output of the code you're seeing here, which sets up our digital experimentation lab. Firstly, we see an example data output for a sample of 2,500 people, providing us with coefficients and standard errors for each predictor. A standard error is a measure of how much our estimates, like the married coefficient, might fluctuate if we took another sample. In essence, it tells us about the precision of our estimate. A smaller standard error suggests our estimate is more precise and less influenced by random chance. Here, a regression model is outlined where we are trying to predict wage based on factors like whether people are married, how many years they have spent in education, whether they have a master's degree, and how many years of work experience they have. Using regression models like this, we can isolate the effect of a single factor, such as marital status, on wages, while keeping other factors constant. This helps ensure we are capturing the genuine impact of that factor without interference from others. The key here is the married coefficient, indicating the wage difference between the married and single people. The test statistic measures how far our observed result in the married coefficient deviates from our initial assumption. If our married coefficient is equal to 1.5, while well, our hypothesis is that the difference between the wages of the married and single people is zero, we can compute the test statistic by measuring this difference in standard error units through this formula. Married coefficient minus hypothesized value, all divided by the married coefficient's standard error. An extreme enough test statistic compared to the critical value at the 5% significance level might hint at rejecting our null hypothesis. The significance level is a threshold we set beforehand. Often, it's at 
which means we are willing to accept a 5% chance of rejecting our null hypothesis when it might actually be true. Think of it like setting a sensitivity level for when we would sound an alarm. The critical value is linked to this significance level. It's like a benchmark on our scale. But we also need to find the degrees of freedom. That is, the difference between the number of observations in the sample size and the number of variables, including the constant term. This is an adjustment for the size of the sample and the number of variables considered in the regression. So, if we have a sample size of 2,500 and 5 variables in the regression like marital status, years of education, master's degree, years of experience, and the square of years of experience as well as the constant term, the degrees of freedom would be 2,494. If our test statistic goes beyond this benchmark, the alarm rings, and we would typically reject our null hypothesis. It's a way of saying, Hey, this result is pretty rare if our initial assumption was true. Traditionally, statisticians use tables or calculators to find the critical value based on these degrees of freedom and the chosen significance level. In this case, our alternative hypothesis only cares about no equality to zero, so we look at both the positive and negative regions, hence we divide the significance level by two. If the alternative hypothesis otherwise stated either a greater than or smaller than sign, then the process would be different and we would not divide the significance level by two. However, to make things easier, I have integrated this computation into the code I made, so everything's in one place, in perfect balance. This plot visualizes our test statistic, represented as a red dot. The further it is from the orange shaded region, the more it suggests a potential deviation from our initial assumptions and that we should therefore reject our null hypothesis. These sliders adjust parameters to let us tweak our testing conditions. For example, if our married coefficient in the theta output happened to be smaller, we could possibly decide to not reject our null hypothesis, and similarly with a larger standard error for the married variable. Hence, the further into the orange shaded region our test statistic is, the more it suggests that our initial assumptions are not far-fetched and that we should not reject our null hypothesis. To explore independently and gain further insights, you can use this code on my website through the link in the video description below. While numbers can indeed tell powerful stories, it is crucial to approach them with a critical mind. Always be ready to question, to dig deeper, and to uncover the true narrative behind the data. So the next time you come across thought-provoking claims, be it in economics or over a coffee chat, you have got the mindset to go beyond and seek the truth.